Hi, and welcome everybody. I see there's quite a few attendees joining us by Zoom and a few by Facebook Live. I want to um, welcome you. Thank you for joining us for today's Monday Mentoring Minutes. I am so excited to have with us a new friend of mine and a fellow author through, who I met through our, our publisher. Julia is in the house, Louisiana. Thank you, Julia, for being here. Um, Jennifer Conweiler. Um, Jennifer and I um, hit it off right away. We have much in common, um, including our passion for people and creating uh, inclusive workplaces. But I want to talk to you a little bit about Jennifer's specialty today. Jennifer uh, and I want to invite you to think of a team that you're involved in. It could be a work team, a volunteer team, or a social team. And as you think of that, I want to invite you to think about what would it look like if you could double the effectiveness of that team? Jennifer says you can do that simply by tapping into the wisdom and the influence of the quiet 50%. Those are the introverts who make up half the population and half your team. Jennifer Conweiler is an author and a global speaker. She's been called the champion for introverts. Her best-selling books, The Introverted Leader, Quiet Influence, and The Genius of Opposites have been translated into 17 languages. She has a new book coming out in June as well, which we'll tell you about uh, at the end of this uh, session together. Uh, she's consulted with hundreds of organizations like Merck, NASA, and the CDC, which is interesting in light of what's happening today. She's run leadership programs from Singapore to Spain. She's been in Forbes, Time Magazine, The Wall Street Journal. She's an extrovert. Her husband, Bill, is an introvert, so she knows a lot about communication between introverts and extroverts. And Bill thanks us for bringing her with us today so that he can get some quiet time. Um, <laughs> Uh, and she's going to help us understand today communication between introverts and extroverts in this time, particularly in mentoring and particularly in remote teams. So, Jennifer, thank you so much. Um, and before uh, we dive right in, as Jennifer says in the chat, please share your questions. We'll be monitoring the chat box and um, uh, making sure that those questions get to Jennifer as well. So Jennifer, welcome. Lisa, thank you. I'm usually on the other side doing Facebook Live. So I'm, it's a thrill to be with you today and to be with everybody um, in what we're all becoming kind of used to now, right? These Zoom conversations. So yeah, and they work really well if you guys have yeah. questions and you wanna throw them in. So thank you for including yeah. me in your series. I'm, I'm honored and I'm so excited. I have your new book right with me here. Uh, bridging differences for better mentoring. So it's a wonderful take on mentoring. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, there's there's a lot of intersection between what you do and I do. And in fact, yeah. your book, The Genius of Opposites, talks about bridging differences between introverts and extroverts. It talks about how do you achieve great results together. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what that means in today's environment of uh, working remotely. How does that impact introverts and extroverts? Well, Lisa, you know, it's funny, there's a lot of memes going around right now that introverts are so happy to be home and, you know, extroverts are going crazy. And, you know, there's probably a little truth in every stereotype, but in reality, what I see happening um, is that we are having an opportunity now, uh, number one, to our, our differences are amplified, so we need to be aware of that. Um, and we also, on the other hand, have this common experience. And so I think on many levels, and when we think about mentoring, it's bringing us closer. Um, to have this shared experience. And uh, I'm seeing a lot of positives come, come out from it. When I talk about being amplified, like for instance, you know, introverts are, um, you know, sometimes when you are too much into like solitary work and the research confirms this, when I did research on remote work for the latest book, it was about uh, finding that remote work in small doses, maybe one or two days a week is really perfect for many introverts. Mm. But here we are now, right, with a uh, slam dunk into the wall, you know, you're not only going to be working five days a week or more at home, but you're also going to be homeschooling, living with your partners who you didn't live before. So there's a lot of uh, things that we have to get used to. But it, um, so, so introverts can really be um, very stressed from that, from that overstimulation. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, extroverts, I'm hearing from a lot of extroverts, it's quite interesting now, saying that, you know, it's, they're actually surprised that they're finding benefits from stopping the busyness. But they're also at times feeling very antsy and anxious because they don't really have outlets for all that energy. Because as we know, just to dial it back a second, the definition or the, when we think about extroverts and introverts, it is about energy and, and extroverts get charged up by the stimulation, the outside stimulation. They need more of that. 
um, to mm-hmm. for their dopamine to be, you know, really in full gear, whereas introverts don't need as much. So, you know, they're finding that they have to reach that. Extroverts have to sort of reach that balance. But I'm getting surprising uh, reactions, unexpected. You would, you would think, again, about the stereotype. Introverts are saying, no, I like people. It's not like I want to be alone mm. all the time. So, so again, our differences are being amplified, but at the same time, we have this common theme and common uh, experience, unlike any other that any of us have ever gone through. You know, it's interesting as an extrovert myself, I wonder, you know, there's, there's still a sense of disconnection, even with working remotely. It's not the same. And I'm wondering what your thought is on um, why, why does it have that feeling of difference? Than, than of different being different than being in person. And why does it not have that same sense of connection, even when we're, here we are face to face and thousands of miles away, right? Yeah. Well, again, there's some positives to the virtual connection and, and there is, but I'll get to your question. And we just got another good question in here too. Um, we can see, like if we're in a team situation, what people have been sharing is it's positive for them to see the facial expressions. If they have it on gallery view, for instance, or in Teams, whatever the platform is, to see everybody in the room. Whereas on a conference call, let's say you don't have that. What people are missing, Lisa, what you're talking about is that stop and chat. Like, Mm. stop by. I had a project manager say to me the other day, she goes, you know, if I need to check with somebody, I don't want to always be sending them an instant message. We're getting too bombarded. She goes, in reality, what I would do if they're in the office a few days a week, is stop by their cube, you know, their, their office area. And we just have a, a general chit chat. Well, those general chit chats are not in place. And I think that may be what you're responding to. What are you noticing about the lack as an extrovert of, uh, of actual physical presence? You know, it, it's exactly that. It's the, oh, and by the way, how is your cat doing? You know, oh, and by, because you come and you connect in these Zoom meetings for a purpose, which is really important to have really purpose-driven conversations, but yeah. I, you do miss the, you know, hey, um, you know, how, how was the weekend? How was that hike? Um, and just yeah. the, oh, yeah. and by the way, it's really that piece of connection. And in all honesty, I miss touching people's hands and, you know, uh, you know, squeezing people on the shoulder and that kind of thing. Not always appropriate in the workplace, but very true. And some, <laughs> right, but some, right, that's true. And some of your yeah. introverts are going, yes, I don't want that anymore. You know, yes. that part is positive. Better, and, you're extrovert, right? and you're extroverts too. Again, um, I think those yeah. days as, as an aside are probably over with touching hands. You know, we're going to all yeah, have to no, do for sure. something different. But no, I think yeah. there's a balance. And I think that's what I'm, I was talking about. We kind of went from a sprint. Oh, let's try remote work in your area. Let's see how it works. It's the exception to the rule. Let's t- check it out. That was still sort of the norm in a lot of fields and a lot of organizations. And now you're slammed against, so it's marathon. You know, it's like, figure this all yeah. out. So yep. I think it's just like a shakeout. So I, I thought maybe Marcel's question, and I'd love to hear what people think about that. I'll re- how can we get introverts to express their intelligence in teams or online interviews more? Um, and so I, I great think there's question. a couple of, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think introverts are saying that they want to be heard in those situations. And one practice I'll share with you that was um, g- given to me in this interviews for the latest research was from a woman named uh, Pat Waters, who's a senior VP at ServiceNow in HR. And she learned years ago as an introverted leader that one of the ways that she could be heard, and she encourages her team to do this, is um, to use sort of the chat function to reach out to people who aren't really expressing themselves and find out, you know, what is it you'd like to share? Um, And you can even make that arrangement ahead of time. So you can be kind of an ally, Mm -hmm. right? We talk about diversity and allies uh, ahead of time and say, look, I'm here. If you want me to sort of segue you into the room, let me do that. Um, Because it's just as awkward on a virtual meeting for introverts to speak up. Uh, In fact, sometimes more so they're telling me now than it is even in, um, in in a physical meeting. So, you know, act as allies for each other. Um, and those, that's one, one good, I think, answer or one possible answer, you know, to Marcel. And I'd love some, some of the folks are responding here, too. Um, I don't yeah, know there's you, great. If you want to choose um, the questions. We're, I love all this uh, chat. And by the way, as, as those questions are coming in, uh, the chat is a really, I've, I've been doing online training for years for introverts. And I have always found the chat function to be a lot more active and engaging than um, the actual um, speaking. And uh, the introverts, people will talk back and forth. And one of the strengths of introverts uh, is writing, is expressing yourself. And tell me if you agree with this, introverts are on the call. Uh, 
you know, right, expressing yourself, kind of A, figuring out what you think about um, a topic, uh, and B, expressing your thoughts to others through writing. And again, some of our extroverts are tapping into that side because we are not one dimensional. We're all probably more close to the bell curve in the middle than we are extreme introverts or extroverts. You know, there are some outliers. Yeah. But, um, but many of us have that side of ourselves. So are you, some extroverts are sharing with me now that they're journaling more, that they're, you know, they're putting more thought into some of the emails they're sending. So we're tapping into that introvert side of ourselves. Uh, I wonder if you yeah, introverts are finding the extra that you're getting to connect with people more. Yeah, let us know in the chat if you're if you uh, are an introvert or um, identify sometimes as an introvert, right? Because there is a bit of flexing uh, as well. Um, let us know what your thoughts on how using the chat and and really um, uh, using writing as a way to uh, mm -hmm. process during this time. You know, it's interesting, Jennifer. And there's a, a couple great questions that I want to get to in just a second. But one of the things that we talk about in bridging differences is so important here is the idea of communicating the communicating with commonality and also communicating across differences, right? So um, in that sense, if you know, if you're on a Zoom call or you're facilitating a meeting or a team, leading a team and you can use the chat as well as this face-to-face, it's a great way to flex and invite the introverts to proceed as well. So Lori asked a great question that I wanna to get to here. She said, do Zoom meetings give an advantage to the fast talkers or thinkers and a disadvantage to the introverts who sometimes need more time to think something through. How do you allow time for everybody to speak up? You know, some of the basic principles of good meetings, good meeting hygiene, I've heard it called, um, are certainly in play here. So I have noticed that some Zoom meetings, just like regular meetings, Lori, are not coming in with good agendas. And it's very important in these kind of digital communications to still keep to the basics of like, what's our agenda? What's our timeline? You know, our hard stop is then we're going to stop. We're going to make sure we hear from everybody. So I think the Zoom meetings, actually, they can give an advantage to fast talkers, but it's how you use it and how you moderate it. And it gives you as a facilitator of the meeting and a participant a way to be more engaged. So what do I mean by that? You know, I have, you know, I'm laughing about this, but I have done mute all sometimes when I don't want everybody to be talking at once. I mean, you can, you've got a little bit of element of control there, right? It's right, one right. of the advantages I'm finding, and I'm, I have to say I'm a little frustrated. I was complaining to Bill before about that, my introvert. I was like, I have been using digital kind of communication techniques for a while, and a lot of my peers in my age have not and so an advantage the more you know about how these functionalities can help you i'm finding it's uh it's very helpful and part of my frustration was i'm finding myself teaching a lot of people <laughs> and i'm not i'm very Absolutely. patient but i'm you know what i'm saying but i'm also any of you tech people out there i have total empathy for you now or very strong empathy because it takes a lot of patience when people are yelling well how do you do this and how do you set up the meeting and blah 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 so those extroverts are doing that. Now, introverts have been complaining. I was just on a call with a team uh, in Cincinnati last week, and they're saying that one of the big, we did a poll, and one of the biggest challenges still that introverts have from extroverts is interruptions. So how can you manage that on Zoom? Can you go around and say, let's just go around and hear from each person. Let's use a poll, right? Let's follow up with the chat. So again, do you agree with that, Lisa, that you're finding there's some um, tools here that you could use that you couldn't use otherwise? A hundred percent. And, you know, breakout rooms is a great tool for that as well. So you can have some oh. smaller conversations because Perfect. when you have a gallery of 60, 70 people or even 10 to 12 people, that can be really right. overwhelming for the people who want to talk as well. There's some great comments in the chat that I want to raise. And then I want to switch just a little bit to talk about um, the intersection here of mentoring. So yes. uh, Marcel said she's the ENFP, which is the most introverted of the extroverts. There, uh, Tijin said the great thing about the chat function is that she feels she has um, time to think and process on their own time. Um, okay. Julia says they're using agendas and unmuting each person. Um, and then Melissa asked the question here, what strategies do you have for situations where you're a participant and not the facilitator and the meeting is moving extremely quickly because the extroverts are leading it and pushing, pushing, pushing through the agenda? Great mm -hmm. question, Melissa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things you can do is, well, it depends on the dynamics of your group. 
Um, but, you know, again, part of good meeting hygiene, and there's a lot, a lot written about this, is to debrief uh, very quickly, how did the meeting go? And you do a quick poll, you know, you could make it anonymous of what, um, of what was effective. One of the questions you could suggest is, you know, did every, was everybody heard? Uh, you know, you can also have an offline conversation with the facilitator because it's very important that we don't let these meetings get out of, get out of hand. You know, one of the things I'm hearing a lot about is Zoom burnout. So it's like, again, do we want to get in a situation where we have to meet for everything? You know, I am very encouraged, and some of you tell me if you have found this out there, by the back to the use of the telephone. I mean, and you can actually get people a lot of times. They're happy to have a yep. phone call rather than be on Zoom. And you don't always have to be looking at people. Um, another thing that you're hearing a lot about, right, is happy hours. Like, oh, let's have a happy hour. And the introverts are telling me, that's enough already. I, I can only, you know, it, to me, it's pressure. I have to show my face just like I do at the company reception. So how about doing, like, Lisa, I love your idea, the breakout rooms, having a one-on-one. -on -one. Let's schedule, you know, some one-on-one -on -one conversations. Some, I know someone just did it over lunch. And they were just making their lunch, each of them, in their kitchen, taking a break, getting mm -hmm. away from you know, sort of like that group interaction. So this, I think like any time in crisis, we saw it happen at 9-11, we saw it in you know, dot com. They're all different, of course, but we all, didn't we also have to become very creative? Now, some of you are too young to Absolutely. remember those, but you probably heard about that from your parents. <laughs> <We've had> to... <laughs> Absolutely. Maybe Lois can Absolutely. tell you, Lisa, right? Lois can tell you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I, I definitely lived through that for sure. I, and as an adult, so. Um, right, you know. right, right, right. Uh, all right, so I, wanted, I want to switch just a little bit. There's some great questions that I'll try to get back to as well. Um, and, and actually, Melissa's latest question really is a nice uh, bridge to that. Her question is about respecting the privacy who don't want to share, of uh, people who don't want to share their homes or eat over Zoom mm -hmm. with others. And that really leads into my question is when you're in a mentoring relationship and one person is an, an, an introvert and one person is an extrovert and you're really uh, forced because of today's reality to communicate virtually, whether by Zoom or by phone, how do yeah. you bridge those needs for privacy and boundaries uh, and space and processing in those relationships? Like in any kind of a, a close relationship or one that you want to make closer, I, I believe it's very important for transparency. And to sort of be very open when I say that about what your style is. And particularly now, Lisa, as the schedules that we have have shifted, you know, it's definitely time to have a check in with your mentor or your mentee uh, about what's working and what isn't. You know, um, you know I, I need to take a walk at noon, but I also want to kind of check in with you. So could we do a walking discussion? You know, that's a different maybe format that you did before when you had a more formal mm -hmm. meeting with your mentor. But really talk to them about your energy flow because that, that's key right now. And that's true with your teams too, to discuss what that's looking like at home right now. Uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, with a lot of you having to, uh, you know, how many of you are having to homeschool? It is a challenge. I'm watching my, my son-in-law and, and, and daughter do it. it. It is a real challenge to oversee that. Um, so, you know, maybe those mm -hmm. times when you were available before you not. So, but just having a discussion about the way you communicate. And I thought maybe I could share just from the Genius of Opposites, a little shameless plug here. Mm -hmm. um, this is sure. a book that we've referenced before, Lisa, in talking about partnerships. And um, when you were introducing me, it's really around, we did research around how successful partnerships make it work who are opposite, who are introverts and extroverts. And I studied, uh, you know, 50 of them and interviewed them each in depth, each separately. And we came up with five different uh, themes. And this is uh, from the genus of opposites. And I just want to kind of read those to you if that's, if that's, if you'll so mm -hmm. indulge me. Of course. And uh, I can hold up the model here because we have a little photo, a little video. Um, so the first thing is to accept the alien. And it's really saying that, you know, you can't change the person who's opposite from you but you can try your best to understand them because when you do that, you'll be in for a lot less stress. So any of you who've been in more long-term partnerships, you know that that's it. You realize you come to a point, you're not gonna change the person, but you can influence them, but you cannot change them. Think of a spouse, right? Uh, 46 mm -hmm. years old, later, I'm still, four, I'm still trying to at times, right? Number two, bring on the battles. That's the second one. We talk about bring on the battles. And, and that sounds like what? Bring on the battles. It's really about encouraging disagreement, seeing it as necessary. 
and, uh, and you know, to arrive at better outcomes because you challenge each other to come up with better solutions. And again, back to the situation now, we have a chance to be creative. Um, I talked to, and I'll just veer off this for one second, I talked to a director yesterday who told me that they are, she's been trying to get her person who reports to her for years to, be, to use more technology and also to kind of maybe get into some other departments and, and, and diversify. Well, the person's furloughed, but they're giving her an opportunity to go work in another department. It's forcing her to do that. Second thing is she's having to use technology. So it, it's having a lot of positive, inc positive results. There was a lot of disagreement, but you know, now they're coming to some sort of a like, hey, this isn't so bad. So bringing on the, the battles. Casting the character mm -hmm. is the next one, and that's really looking at where you each fit into the, the scheme of things and, and who, does, who has talents and superpowers that can play to that particular problem. Um, the fourth is destroy. You might be hearing an ABCDE here. Destroy the mm -hmm. dislike. And that's about um, when you respect each other and act like friends, then you can work more effectively together. You can talk openly. You can have fun. And I'm I've just gotten some comments back from a class we ran last week with a group and people talked about how they're getting to know individuals at a deeper level just because they're asking them, you know, how are you doing? How are you handling this? Mm -hmm. And they're sharing, people mm -hmm. are sharing openly and people want to, we all want to talk, you know, some days more than others. And we're all going through emotional roller coasters. So this common bond is really creating that kind of maybe what bothered us and irked us about the person sitting next to us now, we're like, we have compassion. You know, maybe they have a sick relative or they're worried about their kids out of town. So we, our empathy meter goes a lot up, you know? You know, you're talking about something I've been thinking yeah. about a lot, which is this idea of curiosity and compassion really being essential for communication in this time, right? Is yeah. What's going on with you and, and getting to the point where you've created some mm -hmm. safety so you can really have compassion across those lines. That's huge. That's huge. Um, a few gems from the folks who are uh, listening in here. Um, Rachel asked for a formal contract or informal ideas for kind of expectations about how often to talk, where to talk, how much personal life you share, maybe something for mentors and mentees to fill in. Rachel, mm -hmm. great idea. You're talking about boundary conversation in the mentoring relationship, something we talk a lot about at Center for Mentoring Excellence. And um, a great idea for an uh, article that I will write, and if you um, put in your chat to me, you can put it in just to the um, panelists if you don't want to make it public, your email address, I'll make sure to send you a copy um, of that uh, as well. I can also post it on our Facebook page for those. Maybe, um, Lisa, you could share, you could help, oh, I'm sorry, I, I was just going to say you could um, yeah. be helpful to everybody maybe to just generally give us a high-level overview of, of contracting between mentors and mentees that, yeah. that you have learned about that because this is very relevant now with team members too having a contract yeah with for sure other. so this is a boundary conversation and this is a conversation that mentors and mentees will want to be having at the beginning of their mentoring relationship but the beauty and the I should say the the, the key factor in a contracting conversation is to continually have that conversation and have check-ins throughout the course of your mentoring relationship and anytime there's a change is a great time for that so this would be a great time to say mm -hmm. things like you know how often should we talk how do you feel about zoom what can we do to make Zoom feel more comfortable to you? To Melissa's question, do you want to be sharing your uh, background? If you're uncomfortable with that, let's do virtual background. I encourage you, if somebody is uncomfortable with the background, both put vir on virtual backgrounds. Why? Because it creates a sense of safety and a non-judgment um, as well. So um, Jennifer's noting in the chat that there's some free quizzes for introverts and extroverts at her website, which is jenniferconweiler.com. So I encourage you to check that. Out as well. Other things for boundary conversations. You know, Lisa, just, you may have just, talked at the. Mm -hmm. No, I was going to say something yeah, about the, the background. The virtual backgrounds, particularly on Zoom, can be kind of funky, and it you know it actually moves with you sometimes. So, if you're really wanting to have a professional conversation, be be wary of the backgrounds and just kind of clean up where you sit. Like sit in a different place or buy the right those. You can mm -hmm. get them on Amazon, like a cheap, you know, screen. Or what do they call them? Green screens. Yeah. So just Great be aware yeah, that the exactly. virtual backgrounds can, if you're trying to hold something up, you can't see it. So, so maybe somebody wants to go right. in the, the chat on that. Sorry. Yeah, you for sure. That's a great else. point. No, yeah. that's a good point. So the backgrounds is huge. Also, you know, it's funny. I once did a uh, workshop and it was over lunch and the content, I got great results on the, on a con, on the great comments on the, on the content. 
and half of the people in the feedback said, we love having a lunch conversation. It feels really intimate. It feels like you're sharing it. And the other half said, don't make me talk over lunch. Um, and I think that that's a really important, that was a really important reminder to me to check in right. uh, in my conversations. You know, my own uh, orientation is that I love dining with people, whether it's virtual or live, but that's not everybody else's, everybody's preference. So that's another great boundary conversation. The other thing that's a really significant boundary conversation is the scope of the mentoring discussion itself. Very often people will say, I want to just talk about the professional. And yet so many of us are dealing with so much on a much broader scale now that we're faced with a lot of fear, uncertainty, grief, whatever you want to call the emotions that are going on. So checking in and talking about whether people want to have a conversation about that uh, is, um, is important too. Um, Kate is saying that uh, that's a really good point that can feel really intrusive uh, mm -hmm. for people who still need their lunchtime to step away and not be at work during that time, even for extroverts. So having right. that and, boundary conversation. And, and one, one follow on to what you were saying, Lisa, I think the sharing personally can be layers of an onion. You don't have to go really deep. Some people want to, you know, will share a lot of things that really are happening to them. Others you know, aren't interested in that, or maybe you just gave, give something sort of like not really deep, uh, you know, perfunctory or talking about their neighbors and what they're learning. And you know, so you can, and that brings up another point as you are kind of navigating through these one-on-one -on -one and these team conversations now, I think it's really important to not just dive into the work, like to take one second to do that icebreaker, you know, a minute. Like what's been going mm -hmm. well for you? What's a challenge? You know, what it, one somebody asked me yesterday on a call, what are you learning? You know, a nice open-ended conversation. And then that person you're talking to can choose to go in different directions or they can, you know, just share something and then you get into the work. I, I think that rapport building right now, particularly as we were talking virtually, Lisa, is, uh, is important to do. Do you agree rather than just diving right into the work? Well, everything has to happen in the context of trust, right? You're not yeah. going to share in a relationship if you don't take time to build the trust. And that is that that means not necessarily diving right into that. What you would say is the meat of mentoring. Part of the work is establishing that trust and right. Um, right. Uh, going in. Lori says here, I love that people are sharing what yes. they're reading and movies that they're watching. That's a great point, Lori, because you can ask something like that to really start to establish that rapport. Um, and having you learn about them too, on a regular right? basis. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you learn about exactly. what it's people what they're call, Right, right. I was on a call this morning where somebody said that the way that they're connecting with their team is they're using Slack, which is another internal chat mm -hmm. uh, yeah. thing. And they have um, different things each week. Like this week, their challenge to each other was to replace their personal profile on Slack with a celebrity that they admire. What a great conversation starter, right? You might not want to do that on your external facing po profile, right? It would be a little bit funny to have, uh, I love you know, that. Maya Angelou as my profile picture. But, um, but it, it's, it, what a great conversation starter that is. So finding ways to do that, things like that, and make it a little fun um, can really make a big, big difference. All right, and we well, have one team. Time, I know, I, I, was yeah. gonna, I had to get this idea in it as the extra. Yeah. Some team yeah. last week said that they post baby pictures and you have to guess who the baby picture is. Isn't that cute? I love that. <laughs> I, I love absolutely that too. love that. I you love know, that. <laughs> it's just, it's really fun. We had, my husband had a team uh, call where they showed something that was in their environment, right? They would, they would say, you know, pay, take a, bring, come to the team call with something in your work, in your home space that's special to you. Oh, um, again, you have to have the basic trust in order mm -hmm. to do that. But um, lots of fun ways and really good ways to engage and get to know each other and build that rapport in the absence of being together personally. Um, Jennifer, your time is a gift to all of us. Uh, your yes was really special um, for me. I really appreciate this chance to catch up in this way. I want to make sure that people know about your uh, book, which right. is the... Um, Creating an introvert-friendly workplace. You can, can you order it on Amazon now? You can. You can order it, pre-order it uh, on Kindle or paperback. And it's, the subtitle okay. is How to Unleash Everyone's Talent and Performance. And really, that's what we've been talking about now. And in the world that we're in now, we have a whole, we did research, as I said, on remote working and workplace designs, where when we get back in the office, uh, for 
some of us, right? Uh, and we have a lot of other things on how to lead and communicate with introverts. So it's the fourth book in the series and I'm happy to have people ask questions, check it out, you know, come on my website. There's quizzes we have that'll help you figure out in particular on this topic, you know, how are you communicating with your introvert or extrovert and where, what's going well and where's there's an opportunity to improve. So yeah, creating introvert friendly workplaces. Lisa, it's been a pleasure. Thank Super. you so much. Yeah. Oh, it's such a joy. I put the, the link to your book in the chat. The other thing I want to tell folks is join us next Monday as well. We're going to be talking with Chevy Cook. Chevy is the um, uh, founder of militarymentors.org, which is an organization that I'm on the board of. He is an expert in a subject called in extremist mentoring, which comes from his mentoring, uh, excuse me, from his military background, but it's really about how do you mentor in extreme times. So we encourage you all to join us uh, again uh, next week. And we'll have this posted on our YouTube channel so you can revisit it. And also we'll have a copy of the chat so you can see some of the great links that Jennifer shared with us as well. Jennifer, thank you again. Such a joy. Lisa, and thank you everybody for all your engagement. Have a great week. Thank you so much. Have a great week. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye.